Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all? All right. Last night, I was out too late for me at Lawler Palooza. So congratulations to ancient, not so ancient Greece, whatever it was. Where, where are you guys? You guys stand up. We'll give you a congratulations for winning. Is that your crew? Well, then stand up. What are you waiting on? Y'all are Lawler. All right. Congratulate them for doing a good job. Yeah. Printy Wars is coming next week. Is that right? All right. Friday night, do not forget, we have the involvement fair. So if you are looking for a way to get plugged in, if you are looking for a local church, if, you are, if you're sitting here and you're like, I need more friends, go to the involvement fair, find one of the orgs that does something you like, get plugged in, get involved, and you'll make more friends. And so Friday night, involvement fair, and then there's a party afterwards. And so make sure you go out and do that. Would you guys join me in expressing your appreciation to Brian and Laura White for being here this week and for Brian preaching? Thank you, brother. It's been a good week. I am thankful for you, thankful for the gospel, and so it has been good. So let's pray, and we'll get out of the way, and we'll listen to Brian as he brings the word to us today. Dear Lord, would you just give us open ears and open hearts to hear what you have to say? Lord, would you help our minds just to settle? Would you help us to be able to focus in on your word? Would you help us, Lord, to be receptive to what the Spirit is saying to us? Whatever we need to do in our lives, Lord, would you give us the passion to be able to do it and do it well, whether that's putting sin behind us, whether that's rearranging some idols, whether that's our passion for evangelism, whatever it is, Lord, help us to surrender and help us to serve you well, because Jesus is worthy in his name, amen. Everybody right now is thinking we're not doing any worship. Um, we're going to worship at the end because when we jump into this passage, you're going um, to want to worship at the end. Um, this has been such a great week, and I just want to express for my wife, Laura, and I um, how grateful we are to have been able to spend these days with you. Um, just to be on campus, I mentioned the other day, there's never a time I walk across this campus that I'm not grateful for what God did in my life. Um, but I'm really thankful that this week we've just been able to spend it with you. And we've been talking about surrender and the first day, let's just kind of review a little bit. The first time we were together, we talked about surrender defined, understanding who it is that we're supposed to surrender to and exactly what he expects. And if you have surrender defined, you need to look at what can derail it. So in the second time, we were talking about identifying the idols and learning the lessons so that our thinking and the things that we hold on to, we can lay them down before the Lord. In that third session, we talked about, listen, even if the entire crowd turns around and leaves, there's no turning back for us. We are decidedly surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in these last couple times we're together, we've talked yesterday about like, okay, if I'm surrendered and I fail in my discipleship, like, how do I follow after failure? And then last night, like, desire to see more people surrender to Christ. Um, I actually want to end our time talking about a passage of scripture that helps me to surrender daily. There's one of these different passages, there's several passages I have that I go back to on a regular basis. Ephesians chapter one is one of them, but we're gonna be in Revelation four and five today, um, and I wanna just kinda talk through both of these chapters. See, I, I told you ahead of time that we're gonna do the worship at the end, because if I said, I'm gonna preach through two chapters today, you're like, they just totally wiped the worship out. No, 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 we're gonna do it. Um, we're gonna be in this set of chapters to help us see how to surrender daily. You know, I'm somewhat intrigued by the whole modern phenomenon of influencers. Like influencers are those people that because they have a social media following, um, they suddenly are important for some reason. It's like if my favorite influencer shows a picture of them hanging off of a 30, 
story building. It can't really be that hard. I'm sure most normal people can do that. Can we just agree? That's not a good idea. That's not a good idea. They're like your favorite influencer is wearing a certain thing or expressing a certain opinion, and people are like, well, I mean, like, if they think it, I mean, we probably should think it. That's a bad idea. The whole, in, the whole influencer concept is a bad idea because the philosophy that's behind that is the now should influence the future. The problem with that is the Bible like showing us so many other things in the kingdom life that's upside down, it's the opposite. I'll write this down if you would. Here's our kind of main idea that we're gonna unpack today. I want you to let the end shape the now. Not the other way around. Let the end shape the now. The truth of eternity should shape the worship of today. As is typical with this upside down living, the opinions and actions and pressures of the now certainly have the potential to influence your future, but what if you could go to the end of the book? Vance Pittman, talking about the book of Revelation, said it this way. He says, we experience, like, if, like, if all of history is like a movie, we experience the movie um, in the time we live in. We can't really see too far in the past. We can't really see too far in the future. If, if all of history is like a movie, we're, like, we're kind of like locked into these frames. But God isn't locked into these frames. God sees the movie of history, every frame of it, all at once. And just imagine if God were to pull you aside and say to you, I want to show you a couple of the frames at the end. Wouldn't you allow that then to change the way you're living now? Well, that is what he's done in the book of Revelation. He's shown us how things are gonna be at the end. And if we're gonna let the end shape the now, there's some things here that can literally help drive you to worship every day. Look at me if you would in Revelation chapter four, starting in verse one. This is the apostle John writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. After this I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I'd heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Now, if we're getting context, first of all, there's been all kinds of commentaries written on chapter four, verse one, and what people think about it. Here's the thing. There's a ton of stuff in these chapters that we could go into and have lectures upon lectures upon lectures. I want you to see at the highest level how these chapters should shape your worship now. And so what you see if we're getting context is the apostle John starts the chapter simply by saying, there's this door standing open into heaven and the first voice, who is the first voice? Voice. Well, go back with me, if you would, into chapter one. In chapter one, as when John starts um, the revelation, when he starts to explain it, it says in chapter one, verse nine, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. All right, so this is the voice that he heard at the beginning. Saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands one like a son of man clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in full strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. So write therefore the things that you've seen that are and those that are to take place after this. This is the voice. He turns and sees the glorified Christ in all his magnificence and this is the voice saying, step up and see what's happening after this. In chapter four, I look, behold, a door standing open and the first voice says, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. What happens at the end? What does it look like at the end? 
Let's just look at it. I want you to see, first of all, this morning, that eternity reveals a reigning king. Eternity reveals a reigning king, and it should prompt a response from us. Look at verse 2. And once I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. He who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there were, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. Around the throne on each side of the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Let's just stop there. Let's make some observations from the text this morning about the throne room. Let me give you five observations this morning about the throne room of heaven that we see in Revelation chapter 4. First of all, note that this throne in the throne room is not empty. Look at verse 2. I was at once in the spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. The first observation I would give to you is this. When you consider the throne room of heaven, the throne is not empty. The throne is not empty. It is God on the throne. We'll see more of this as we kind of walk through this. John actually writes for us um, God and Jesus in very close proximity in these two chapters, almost overlapping in proximity at times. But here's what I would have you know. When you look at the throne and you see God on the throne, the immediate takeaway for you and me should be this. It's not us on the throne. When you go to the end, and if you're going to let the end shape the now, here's what it is. The throne is not empty and you and I, none of us are on it. The first observation would simply be this. It would lead me to that however I should live now should reflect the reality of the then. And if God's on the throne then, God should be on the throne of my life right now. Amen? First of all, note that the throne is not empty. Second of all, I want to just make an observation to you that the throne room scene here is absolutely consistent with the rest of Scripture. If you look at Ezekiel chapter 1, if you look at Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah looks and sees the Lord seated on his throne. The the, uh, train of his robe fills the temple. The angels are singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Here's what I would tell you. If you're looking at Ezekiel 1, Isaiah 6, if you're looking at the presence of God as it's revealed in Exodus 19 on Sinai, if you go to the end of the book in Revelation chapter 21, this throne room scene is absolutely consistent. You're like, Brian, why does that matter? Because the throne is not empty in the, in the scene, and it's never been empty. God is on the throne, and it's always been like that. It's always been like that. The God who reveals himself throughout the Bible has always revealed himself as the sovereign authority over everything. In other words, God's reign over everything doesn't start at some point. It's always been this way. Quick application of that. God is king over everything, whether you acknowledge it or not. He's king over everything. It's always been that way. And if the end would shape the now, we must see that the throne is occupied and it's not us on it and it's never going to be us on it. Maybe a third observation. Keep looking in the text. At once, verse 2, I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. All right, I'm just going to stop there for a second. The only time I ever think about stones is like when I was getting like my class ring, right? Do you guys remember like getting a class ring? Did any of you get a class ring in high school or is that just something that's completely gone now? Okay, I'm totally in favor of this. Um, I've been coaching for the last couple of years. The only kind of rings I want to collect at this point are championship rings. Everybody okay with that? 
Okay, and you don't get to pick all the stones that are in that, but you know, here's the thing. Like when you think about these stones, I'm like, I'm not an expert on Jasper or Carnelian. So if I'm like reading through the text, I've gotta go find out what that is. Um, Jasper is a stone that if it's cut right, is almost translucent. Um, it has an orangish color to it, um, but it's, it's almost translucent if it's done right. A carnelian is more of a bright red stone. And so what you find is this. When he turns and looks at the throne, what's being described here is this. It is bright. Look in the text again. Just look at it. He who said there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Like the first time I read that, I'm like, I wonder if John's starting to go off the rails here because I haven't seen any rainbows that look like emeralds. And I think here's what he's getting after. When you look at the throne, the one who is on the throne is magnificent beyond description. He's magnificent beyond description. And I think what he's describing here is the bright light, the glory of God. It continues to go on and it says this, there was a rainbow that had the appearance of emerald. Around the throne were 24 elders. And then it makes the comment in verse five, from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. Here's all I can tell you. Everything about the description of the throne is it is occupied, it has always been occupied, and the one who occupies it is magnificent beyond our description. In his glory and his power, that's what's being revealed to us. Just a note on that. This is what Jesus left to come here. Think about that. Think about this magnificent description, being in the presence of the Father, and then just think about the fact that this is, this is what Jesus left to come here and go to a cross for us. This magnificent scene. Keep looking, verse five through 11. If what we're seeing so far in our observations are the throne is occupied, the throne has always been occupied, the one who's on the throne is magnificent beyond description, here's another observation I want you to make. The throne and the one on the throne is central to everything else in the picture. Look at verse five. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, do you guys hear the descriptions? Before the throne, around the throne, in front of the throne. Everything in John's description here is literally situated around the throne. The throne itself and the one on the throne is central to everything else in the picture. Everything in the scene is situated with the throne as a point of reference. Every action and response is pointed to the occupant on the throne. And the end of this whole thing puts the attention on God and not on any other participant in the room. The throne is not empty. It is occupied and has always been occupied by one who is magnificent beyond description. And the end shows us that at the end, everything is pointed at him. Quick application. Is everything in your life situated, situated around the daily worship of your God? How much of your life is situated and pointed at you? The throne and the one on the throne is central to everything. Keep looking. You get into this discussion here about these 24 elders. We're gonna to touch on that in a second and these living creatures. In fact, let's just look at it, verse um, seven. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man. The fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And again, a lot of different commentaries have written about what they think these living creatures are. I think these are angels. I think it's very consistent with the other uh, descriptions we see throughout the Bible of cherubim who are literally singing back and forth the praise of God's holiness. Along with these uh, living creatures are these 24 elders. The throne is occupied. It's always been that way. 
The one on the throne is magnificent beyond description. Everything in the room is situated and pointed at the one on the throne. And here's the last observation I would give you based on verse four and verse six through 11. The throne and the one on the throne is surrounded by living, worshiping beings. How consistent is that with John 4? Our God is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. These are the type of worshipers God is looking for. How consistent with that is Malachi chapter 1, verse 11. The name of the Lord will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. And incense will rise to me from every place. Our God is interested in your daily worship of him. That all of life, and I don't just mean singing songs, you're gonna see some of that here, but I think it's every part of your life being situated around the fact that he is king and you are not. That's what you begin to see. Now, in eternity, everything's pointed to the one on the throne. The end should shape the now. Life should be situated around the one on the throne for us. But I want you to look specifically at the response. Look at verse eight. The four living creatures, each of them with six wings, full of eyes all around and within, and day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. The objects of worship the object of worship is clearly the one on the throne. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor, they are giving thanks to him, verse nine, to the one who is seated on the throne. The object of our worship is God himself. The object of our worship, why? Why should we worship him? If you look in the text, it makes it clear. Just read through these again and, and locate these things, his character, his authority or position and his work. Listen to it again. The four living creatures, day and night, they are saying holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. He's holy, he's sovereign, he's eternal, his character, it demands our worship. His authority and position, you are the Lord God Almighty sitting on the throne. You are Lord and God, it says. The 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their thrones. There's an interesting thing there um, that we could miss in the, in the, in the phrasing. Um, different versions of the Bible might cast a different way to look at that. It's either one of placing very carefully the thrones before in absolute respect and submission. But another way that's translated is just simply this. In the middle of worship, as everything is escalating, it's like, this doesn't belong to me. And it's thrown before the Lord. His character, his position, his work. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will, they existed and were created. Your character, your authority, your power, your work, you're the creator and sustainer. And then note the actions of worship. They're falling down. They're bowing to a monarch. They're casting their crowns. It's a physical act of worship that denotes true authority and honor. By the way, I grew up in a church where like if you were worshiping and you started to close your eyes, then you'd probably start to sway a little bit then you'd raise your hands and it was a slippery slope to speaking in tongues and starting to handle snakes. And it was like, listen, to do anything physical in worship was just really dangerous. Here's the thing, here's what you find. At the end, here's, it's all in, it's all in. And if you need to raise your hands, if you need to close your eyes, if you need to get on your face before the Lord, listen, the object of our worship, God desires a physical and a vocal response. They're echoing back his character they're calling him worthy. If the end is going to shape the now, listen, if eternity is going to shape our response every day, this chapter shows us 
the one on the throne is magnificent and deserves our worship. The passage shows us a reigning king. Let's just keep going. We get right into chapter five. And if we are truly worshiping a reigning king, it means we're submitted to him. We're submitted to his truth. We're submitted to his worship. We're submitted to his kingship. But now the story just, the picture changes just a little bit. Look at chapter five. Then I saw at the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he came, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns, with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Let's just go that far. If I made a few observations from chapter four, let me give you a few more observations from chapter five about the scroll and the lamb. The first observation I would give you from verse one is this, there is a scroll presented by the one on the throne. In chapter five, the throne is still occupied and the one who is on the throne has a scroll. That's the first observation. People are like, well, what is the scroll? The scroll is the description of what is to come. It literally is putting into to place the things that are going to happen that bring the end around so that all things are made new. Some people think it's a contract. Some people think it's just a description. Let's just say it's a scroll, a giant rolled up document that is revealing what's gonna happen. Why is it important? Because it holds the truth to the end of all things. The things that must take place so that things are made new. Quick note, the end is already written down. The end is already written down. The people who think that, you know what? I know you don't know what's coming next, but God doesn't either, and so he's just as surprised as you are, and he's just suffering right along with you. I'm just gonna tell you, that's absolute heresy and has nothing to do with what's in the Bible, because what the Bible says is God knows exactly what's going on, and he's seated on the throne when it happens. The end is written down. The end should shape the now. Note in verse two and three, this scroll, here's the second observation, is to be opened. The end is coming, but there is no one who seems able to do it. How many of you ever tried to get an oil filter off of a car? Anybody ever tried that? There are very few things as humbling as getting your arm stuck in an engine trying to get an oil filter off. I mean, like you have your hand up there and you're grabbing a hold of it and you can't do it. And I remember the first time that I changed the oil in the car. I got all the oil drained out of the car. I remember it like it was yesterday. All the oil drained out of the car and I'm like, okay, last thing I had to do is take the filter off. Here's the problem with that whole concept. If you can't get the filter off, you've already taken all the oil out. You can't go anywhere for anybody to help you. You're just sitting there helpless in your garage. Like what I thought I was gonna be able to pull off, I can't. This is not an issue of strength. This is not an issue of you being able to manhandle the scroll. This is not an issue of somebody being important or not. It's, it's an issue of authority, and it's an issue of worth. Look at what the scripture says. Who is worthy to set these things into motion? Again, John's helping the reader see that authority and ultimate worth is not possessed by you or me. We can't pull off the powerful things we're seeing here. And there's no one present, it seems, to open this scroll. Everybody okay? Here we go. Another observation. Look in the text. It says in verse 4, And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll. The inability for the scroll to be opened 
is a sadness-inducing event. Why is that? Because John's been promised that God's going to make all things new at the end. And if the scroll that sets it into motion can't be opened, if all the things can't start happening, here's what it means. Things aren't going to be made new. And he's like, nobody can open the scroll, but the scroll has to happen for the end to come. And by the way, he's already seen such magnificent things. He's like, bring the end, right? And listen, so the scroll can't be opened, and he begins to weep loudly. No one seemed to have the authority to set the events in motion or even proclaim the truth of the end that would bring the good news. And when you consider John's invitation in chapter one and the throne room scene in chapter four, he's like, I want to get to that. Can't somebody open the scroll? Verse five through seven. One of the elders said to me, weep no more, for behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, and he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Here's the observation I would give you. Jesus is able and does open the scroll. He is the one who is worthy. He is the one who has authority. Note the wording that's used here. This is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, he's called the root of David. In Genesis chapter 49, verse 9 and 10, he's called the lion of the tribe of Judah. Here's the thing. Jesus is going to open the scroll. Note the logic that's used here. Why Jesus has the authority and power. Why is he worthy? Why does he have the power? Look in the text. Because he has conquered Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection has conquered all foes, including sin and death. Ultimate authority, ultimate worth is affixed to him. Jesus has conquered. Now note the imagery of verse six. I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Why is that important? Because that's how he conquered. That's how he conquered. The cross was the victory. And then note the factual statement. He went and took the scroll. Man, I'm noting that everything in chapter four and everything in chapter five is nobody's approaching the throne. Do you see that? Jesus walks, as one of the commentators said, without any reticence up to the throne and says, I'll open the scroll. He went and took the scroll from the right hand. I just wanna keep pointing out that everything in Revelation four and five exalts Jesus and God and none of us. He's the one with all the authority He's the one who has accomplished everything necessary. And just like in chapter four, what you see is eternity revealing a reigning king who is a worthy king, and that should prompt a response. The response is is given to us in chapter five, verse eight through 14. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. The response in verse 8 through 10 is the response of the elders. It starts with a statement of worth. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open the seals. It's followed by a statement of reason. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people from God from everywhere. And then there's a statement of accomplishment. By the way, just let that sink in. We're going to spend eternity with people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. Praise God. Praise God. This statement of worth, worthy are you for you were slain, is now a statement of accomplishment. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Jesus does all of this. And what a crescendo is beginning to happen. And then it just keeps going. Look at the next verse. They sang a new song, saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open it. And look at verse 10. You've made them a kingdom and priest to God. Then it just keeps going, okay? The response starts with 24 elders, but then all of a sudden, look at, look at verse 11. Then I looked around and I heard around the throne living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Note here in these verses that the choir has increased. The voice of many angels 
numbering myriads of myriads, the intensity has increased, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb. Note the crescendo, just keep going up. Note the crescendo just keeps going up. And then look at this last set of verses. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all of them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever, amen. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down in worship. The choir has now increased to Philippians 2, 9 through 11 categories. Every single person being able to say, the lamb is worthy. Every knee bowed before the Lord. And what you see is the response of the people in that room begs us to understand if the end would shape the now, what is the response of the people People in this room to a worthy and a reigning king. Why does this help me daily surrender? Because it shows me it's not about me. The throne is occupied. The one who's on it is magnificent. The one who has conquered everything is worthy of it all. And listen, it points the attention away from me. Does the end shape the now? Listen, when we come to Christ, the truth is worship is our continued response of surrender to a worthy and reigning king. And when we come to Christ, the great exchange that we have is his righteousness and his life for our sin and death. But what is often missed is how in the Christian life we continue as surrendered, declared, daily. Here's where this passage leads me. And might it lead us here as we finish our time in worship. Jesus is the king who reigns. His word is my authority. His people are my people. His commands are my direction. His worth is the impetus for my worship. In this room, I'm surrounded by Christ followers, members of the family of God, citizens of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Eventually participants in the greatest choir of all time. Jesus is Lord and he will reign forever and ever and ever. Worthy is the one who is slain and who lives and I will proclaim it with my mouth and I will invite you to proclaim it with your mouth because we serve a reigning and a worthy King Jesus. Amen? So let's let the end shape the now. Having looked at it, let's respond. Let's worship together. Yeah. 
May God be gracious to you. May he make his face to shine upon you and bless you so that God's way would be known on the earth and his saving power in all the nations. Let all of us praise the Lord. You are loved. Have a great day, guys.